All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jill, and I'm happy that you're practicing here with us. Uh, it feels like in person on the Zoom room, um, and and those who are practicing after with us uh, on the YouTube channel. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, so we've we've just been chatting in the Zoom room before the recording about uh, it's it's well is it. Tomorrow? What's the date? No, a couple of days from now. I yeah, I don't even know what day it is. We were just talking about that. Like, oh, what is it? Anyways, it's near the end of June, 2023. And some of us are in different schedules, different rhythms with uh, summer or the changes in weather, perhaps traveling or visiting, et cetera. And, and all the everything in between and what effect that has had perhaps on our practice and really inspired and moved to hear that for some folks it's even deepened their commitment to practice to see that when life gets full and chaotic and uh i won't add more words but uh to see that's when we need to deepen our practice even more <clears throat> I've I've heard this obviously secondhand that the uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was asked I think I read it actually um, how how does how what's his practice look like when things are so busy because of course it's very long days and meetings with lots of people traveling teaching huge complex full days and uh this is a complete um off the top of my head but it was something with the flavor of you know when things are busy I practice even more uh people have kind of expected well you know I just do this or that fit it in when things are busy but he's like when things are intense, even more practice is needed. And so these last two weeks, uh, I've been away and there were guest teachers. Thank you so much to Blakey and Sarah for um, covering for me, filling in and offering Dharma. Those are here on the YouTube channel as well <clears throat> for you to watch. So uh, check those out. Beautiful practices. And I was doing a bit of traveling and visiting and had company and it totally let my practice slide. Um, and I'm really missing it. Uh, kind of as we were alluding to in our chat that, well, no, I'll say for myself that um, I don't just miss that feeling of rest, of stillness of calm clarity um, in myself but I also um, I just realized that I forgot to do this so one second I'm still here okay there uh, but I also noticed that I get if I leave my practice for too long I become more unskillful <laughs> just get a little more less mindful in 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 short so i'm really happy to be back and and happy to feel the supportive community sharing practice again uh yeah so i was thinking about you know as i was aware that my practice had mm, slipped in these last few weeks that uh, i was thinking about beginner's mind you've may maybe heard this phrase of beginner's mind and bringing beginner's mind to our practice I've been thinking about this for a fair bit today and I was, I was like that's kind of like the phrase sleep like a baby it's like babies don't sleep very well <laughs> what are you talking about no babies I raised certainly did not sleep very well so I never understood that sleep like a baby it's like oh my god <laughs> don't wish for someone to sleep like a baby I don't know maybe everybody else has very calm babies um mine were not and um 
no, it's not that they weren't calm, but uh, certainly sleepless nights is an understatement. <laughs> I think I'm still catching up. Yeah, so, you know, sleep like a baby is kind of like beginner's mind because when I think back to my first meditation retreat or many meditation retreats and practices as a beginner, it's not like that was a just a beautiful, awake, curious practice that was a mess. Very difficult, very difficult. Oh, the it's so painful being with the the mind in its habituated reactive state. So yeah, this idea of practicing with beginner's mind, again, could be different for everyone else or for you. For me, as a beginner meditator, that was not uh, something I really aspire to return to. There's so much we've learned from our time of practice. Oh my gosh, so much. How to be skillful with what comes up how to be kind and compassionate and how to see hindrances and um, not fuel them, see their arising and passing, watch all the story-making and self-creating coming and going without, uh, oh, that just reminds me of this great quote that I read today. <laughs> Look at that, I just pulled it off the shelf. So good. Um, it just says Chinese Zen master. So I don't even know who said it. I don't have that. It wasn't, it's something, yeah. When I say not to think, I mean that you, if you have a thought, think nothing of it. So good. So the teacher was saying, when I say not to think, I mean that if you have a thought, think nothing of it. That's a good one. Yeah, so it's not that uh, we stop thinking, but we we know what needs to be paid attention to and what doesn't. And that also just reminds me of this T-shirt I found at Value Village. Uh, I happen to be wearing right now, so I'm going to show you. And it says, I'm trying to clear my mind. <laughs> so great. Rhinestones and skulls. When do I ever wear rhinestones and skulls? But, but I couldn't resist. Um, and a lot of beginner meditators come to a practice with that thought. I'm coming to, I don't want to clear my mind. Oh, I've heard that so many times. I want to clear my mind. I want to be able to turn it off. I'm like, yikes. No, 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 you don't. Don't, don't, don't wish for that. The mind is great. You can imagine and remember and create and fantasize. And what we learn is to see mind is mind. It does mind things. And awareness can watch mind flitting about, trying to become. And um, yeah, so beginner's mind is a, perhaps a, a more helpful phrase that captures the essence of beginner's mind is don't know mind, where we come to something with, mm, or it's more seeing our preconceived ideas about everything and not believing them, <laughs> not or seeing through their conditioned arising. It's not necessarily so. Don't know mind where we bring a lot of curiosity, a lot of energy and freshness to, oh, what is this like actually? What is happening? How is it? And I was really feeling, we we're talking about like missing practice and I was also just missing that feeling of rest. Oh, just to rest in our practice. Sometimes we can get into feeling like our practice is a chore, something I have to do, I should do it. 
and uh so lovely to feel that sense of uh ah oh, you can just drop everything else all the doing and becoming and getting and being and just rest in a simple anchor perhaps the breath perhaps sound or sensation just something really present moment and rest there you know our dear nervous systems our dear hearts and minds are tired and uh i think a lot of us would like this quality of restfulness in our practice so see if if your practice is is giving you that we all have different energies and temperaments, of course, and and it depends on when you're practicing, if you've had good physical rest and sleep. If you if you are physically, energetically tired, then a very restful, calm, easy, not not a hard effort practice might be too sleepy might kind of be too dull for you and so you might need to up the effort and energy and brightness a little bit more <clears throat> but uh, I think for lots of us a nice calm sense of resting and ease might be helpful I'm looking forward to it <laughs> um hmm uh, this is one of my favorite titles for a book uh, from Sylvia Borstein. Don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> just a little turn on the phrase, don't just sit there, do something, which is kind of our culture. Um, and she turns that, don't just do something, sit there. It's a beautiful, sweet, tiny little book, but it's uh, like all of Sylvia's teachings has a lot of wisdom in it and uh, she has this definition for mindfulness uh, in response to a student's question maybe I'll read the question first the student says I'm confused I thought you said mindfulness meditation was a general awareness practice I thought it was a paying attention to everything and now I hear that I'm supposed to stay just with the breath haven't you contradicted yourself? <laughs> the student. Wow. Um, but of course, she responds with wisdom and compassion and says, that's a great question. Uh, it certainly sounds like I contradicted myself. And then she gives this definition of mindfulness. I'll just let this person in. Okay. She says, mindfulness is indeed composed alert moment moment to recognition of all experience and lots of stuff is always happening so mindfulness is composed alert moment to moment recognition of all experience and so then she does a, a, a little list of some, some of the, all of the everything that's always happening. Okay, thoughts, as we know, are continually coming and going. Body sensations of all varieties, pulsing, throbbing, tingling, are busily being perceptible and then disappearing. Moods and emotions are pushing one another in and out of the mind. And the evaluating capacity is clicking, pleasant, unpleasant. I like it. I don't like it. Everything or experience is very complex, even when we're sitting still quietly with our eyes closed or eyes resting. There's so much going on. And so she talks about how... Um, that's why we start resting in the breath. 
You might want to consider the practice of trying to rest attention exclusively in the breath as remedial mindfulness on the road to regular mindfulness. Think of it as a warm-up exercise. What you're trying to do is to condition the mind to be able to stay steady and clear with whatever experiences arise. And if you wanted to juggle eight flaming bowling pins like the flying Karamazov brothers, you'd practice with the pins for a long time before you set them on fire. And you'd probably start with just two. And that's why we start with the breath. So that being said, um, breath will be one of the options for the practice tonight, but practicing with the breath is not... Uh, the best choice for everyone or for anyone all the time. So it, it's one that is important and often used uh, because it's always with us, it's accessible, it's always changing, it's conditioned, it's um, happening naturally and it's affected by thoughts, moods, sounds, etc. There's many reasons why breath is a, it's embodied, first foundation, etc. <clears throat> but there's other anchors that uh, fulfill the, all those requirements as well. Not requirements isn't the right word, all those conditions. And so hearing might be an uh, anchor, if you're in a space where there's some sounds coming and going, you could use that as your primary anchor, just resting back in the body and receiving the experience of hearing, the vibrations meeting the body. It's still present moment, embodied, impermanent, conditioned, etc. cetera. Uh, and or you could use just bodily sensation, perhaps the sensations in your hands. Um, also the same. So why would you choose one over the other? For some people paying attention to the breath as an anchor creates more tension, mm, feels too close or contracted, it can, especially if you're having difficulty breathing with all the smoke and the fires that are happening, uh, breath might not be the best anchor for you. If you feel anxious with breath meditation, then you could choose hearing or a sensation of a bodily part. Yeah, I wanted to read this uh, poem. There's a beautiful book, all oh, my first editions over there, but um, beautiful book called Poetry of Presence, um, Mindfulness Poems, and they've come out with a second edition. Yay! Um, I hope to do a, another poetry and mindfulness course like we did before with this book. <clears throat> Poetry of Presence too, so it's a compilation of a uh, an edit, edited uh, compilation of poems. And this one is called Breathe by Lynn Ungar. Breathe, said the wind. How can I breathe at a time like this when the air is full of, of the smoke, of burning tires, burning lives? Just breathe, the wind insisted. Easy for you to say, if the weight of injustice is not wrapped around your throat, cutting off all air, I need you to breathe. I need you to breathe. Don't tell me to be calm when there are so many reasons to be angry, so much cause for despair. I didn't say to be calm, said the wind. I said to breathe. We're going to need a lot of air to make this hurricane together. Mm. So I, I was just really aware of breathing as a practice right now at this time of the, in here in Canada, there's, well, 
not just Canada, around the world, a lot of smoke and fires from our climate catastrophes and, um, and the injustice, the violence on bodies, particularly black bodies, um, regarding breath and breathing. And, uh, you know, what does it feel like to be practicing with breath and especially in a way where we're trying to cultivate some calm? I love that this poem just speaks to all of that. Don't tell me to be calm when there's so much cause for despair. It can just, I just couldn't believe I found this poem today. It was just so on point for me. And the way she's writing it, the wind is telling us to breathe. The, the wind element, the air element, the earth, water, fire, air elements are reminding us this breath is happening. This breath is here, it's coming and going. So if you choose to use breath as your anchor today, that might be helpful for you. This last note is from uh, Ajahn Amaro. Uh, as I was talking about that feeling, that mm, yearning in me, the wanting, mm, not a wanting, uh, feeling the need for rest in my resting in my practice. Um, he said, he's a Buddhist monk, said, uh, teacher, let the body assume its natural ease. Let the mind assume its natural ease. Now, just stay alert to anything that arises to disturb that natural ease. There's, there's a practice right there. Just the most straightforward instructions for a meditation practice. Let the body assume its natural ease. Let the mind assume its natural ease. And now just stay alert to anything that arises to disturb that natural ease. So these would be all those things that uh, Sylvia was listing thoughts, the emotions, the sounds, the sensations, the hindrances, the wanting, the not wanting. And we just know it just gently. It doesn't take much effort, much less than we think often, uh, to just that bare knowing, oh, this is arising. Restlessness, planning, wanting, not wanting. Ah. And then we just rest back with your anchor, whether it's breath or sound or sensation, as I mentioned. So let's, let's tuck into our posture, adjusting anything you need so that as Ajahn Amaro um, reminds us here to let the body assume its natural ease. So get any other uh, supports that you need for your posture. If you're sitting upright, uh, finding that sense of uprightness through the skeleton, through the spine. And then allowing the body to drape itself naturally and easily around that sense of center. Sylvia Borstein imagines her body hanging around her skeletal form in much the same way a soft wool coat hangs down from a firm hanger in my closet. So feel this sense of 
center and uprightness that can bring some energy. If you're practicing laying down, you might bend your knees and have them upright to help you stay wakeful or lift your forearm. So whatever posture you're in, feeling the, the skeleton, feel the bones. And then let the flesh and the muscles and the skin drape and soften. So that the face comes to rest. The shoulders rest. Tongue and jaw. Eyes resting. And our hands rest. And the heart and belly find some rest or ease, softness or space. The weight of the hips and the groundedness of back body if you're laying down or of legs and feet if you're upright. Let the body assume its natural ease. Let the body remember. Let's take a few moments in silence together and just keep reminding the body, the heart, the mind to rest, just rest. taking refuge here and now in this body, in this moment. Body remembering its natural ease. To whatever degree is possible for you in this moment.
And as Ajahn Amaro reminds us, now letting the mind assume its natural ease. You might have a little voice inside that says, my mind's not naturally at ease. But awake awareness is naturally at ease, receptive, present, calm. If these feel challenging for you at this time, you might bring in a few meta phrases, your intentions. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. May I rest. May I rest. And as the body assumes its natural ease and the mind assumes its natural ease, you may decide to choose an anchor. Could just be just as we are resting in this open awareness. Or it might be supportive for you to choose an anchor like breath, sound, or sensation. And then the instructions from Ajahn Amaro continue. Now just stay alert to anything that arises to disturb 
that natural ease. As we condition the mind to stay steady and clear with whatever experiences arise, we can see and know directly that awake awareness is already here, already at ease, Just knowing all of this arising and passing and rest. A very light and gentle awareness at ease. And very gently awake and aware of anything that disturbs that natural ease. Wanting, not wanting, pleasant, unpleasant coming and going, becoming.
Notice if restlessness or boredom start to arise. And just gently see them as slight disturbances in the natural ease and let them pass in the same way they arose and rest. Rest in awake awareness. The heart-mind reminds us of our intention for practice. May I be happy. May I be safe. 
from inner and outer harm. May I be well in body and mind. May I be peaceful, free from dukkha. May I rest in natural ease. And in the same way that we cultivate these skillful wishes with our own heart mind, we know that all beings, all beings everywhere, wish to have safety, peace, wellness, happiness. May all beings everywhere. Be free from Dukkha. Not sure if you could hear the chihuahuas sounding off in the background there, but hope it didn't disturb your ease or practice. Again, it's just another one of the arisings and passings, and we watch how it just how it may disturb and open again into ease. Lovely to practice with you. Um, lovely for me, I should say. I hope it was fruitful for you in some way. And uh, hope you can join us again. Thanks.